I'm Martha Grogan. I'm the director of the Cardiac Amyloid Clinic at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today I'm really thrilled to have my colleagues with me, Dr. Julie Rosenthal, who's the director of the Cardiac Amyloid Program at Mayo Clinic in Arizona, and Dr. Melissa Lyle, who is the Cardiac Amyloid Lead for the Multidisciplinary Amyloid Clinic at Mayo Clinic of Florida. So welcome, Julie and Melissa. We're going to focus on the new uh, transthyretin amyloid therapies today, but I'm just going to briefly mention that cardiologists should know that AL treatment is really improving, especially with the use of daratumumab. So this is really a game changer and all types of amyloid we're now seeing improved outcomes. So we're going to briefly talk a little bit about what is transthyretin amyloid and what are the drugs that we have um, to treat this condition. So transthyretin is a protein that we all make. It's produced in the liver and it transports thyroid hormone and retinal binding protein throughout the body. So here one sees the structure of the uh, TTR protein. And just to remember that there are two main types of amyloid that can infiltrate the heart, AL, which is due to a monoclonal disorder of the bone marrow, and transthyretin type amyloid, where the protein is produced in the uh, liver. And of the TTR uh, amyloid types, there is both wild type, which is much more common, and hereditary form. So just a quick overview of that. And when we look at transthyretin, again, in transthyretin amyloid, there is no actual disease of the liver. The problem is after the protein is formed. So the liver uh, produces TTR and it should stay intact, but in transthyretin type amyloidosis, it breaks apart. Those monomers then kind of glom together and form amyloid that infiltrates the heart and the nerves and other organs and tissues in the uh, body. So as we talk about these drugs, the reason I showed you that movie is we have a site of action being at the liver. We can have uh, stabilizer drugs that happen at the level of the uh, actual protein. And we can talk about um, fibril disruptors or degraders. And here I've kind of listed some of the names of the medications and whether or not they're in clinical trials or whether they're approved for um, use. And so now we're going to go on and just kind of talk a little bit about these uh, therapeutics. So I'm going to start with Melissa. Could you um, talk to us a little bit about the TTR stabilizers? Sure, absolutely. So the first one that I kind of want to mention is tefamidus. So tefamidus is a once a day oral medication that really stabilizes the TTR tetramer by binding to the T4 binding site. And actually this was the first therapy for ATTR cardiac amyloidosis that was approved by the FDA back in May of 2019. And that was really after the ATTRACT trial. So the ATTRACT trial was a randomized double-blinded study that enrolled 441 patients to either 80 or 20 milligrams of tefamidus or placebo. And the trial demonstrated a 30% reduction in all-cause mortality with tefamidus compared with placebo, as well as a 32% reduction in cardiovascular hospitalizations in patients that were New York Heart Association class one or two. So some of the secondary endpoints from that trial really demonstrated a reduction and the decline in the six-minute walk, and also a lower rate in the decline of quality of life that was assessed by the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. Further subsequent analysis that showed that there was actually a re further reduction in all-cause mortality with the 80 milligram dose, which is why that's the preferred dose. So tefamidus is really our FDA-approved therapy for ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. Great. And, you know, a question that comes up all the time is um, once a patient is on to famous, how do we follow them? Any guidelines for our audience in that regard? Yes, so that's a great question, and really there's no great way currently. So the drug, how it works is it slows the progression of disease. It doesn't necessarily reverse the disease. And so if there is any sort of clinically relevant regression, that would take years to decades to show. So the ways that we follow patients are mostly by clinical assessment. So continue to follow them clinically by physical exam and their general heart failure symptoms. 
We also have found that, you know, frequent serial echo imaging is not that useful either. Follow-up echoes can be useful if there's been progression of symptoms and we think that the echo might change our management or if they're getting serial echoes for another reason, for example, concomitant aortic stenosis. But otherwise, we're actually not getting frequent serial imaging as well. Serum TTR levels um, are an indirect measure of stabilization, so it's very reasonable to get a serum TTR level at baseline and then also once after therapy has been started, but really the utility of serial serum TTR levels uh, is yet to be determined because currently there's no role for a change in dose or up titration of medication, but that might potentially play a role as a biomarker in the future, but right now it's mostly following the patient clinically. That's great. And um, again, we know that there's really no need for safety monitoring. Sometimes people think there are safety labs that we need, but this is a very well-tolerated uh, drug. And I might briefly mention that diflunosol is also an excellent stabilizer. Um, it's, it's not studied in a randomized uh, um, uh, trial uh, for cardiomyopathy specifically, but for patients who have adequate renal function, sometimes we need to use diflunosol because of the financial toxicity of tofambitis. And how about anything else on the horizon um, for stabilizers? Yes, so, and that's a great point about the diflunosol too. We just caution about re bon monitoring renal function as well as worsening heart failure symptoms. But in terms of other potential options in the future, so AG10 is another stabilizer and it actually mimics the stabilizing capabilities of the TTR variant T139M. This is a variant that's been shown in the past to actually be protective against development of polyneuropathy in patients that are heterozygous for the V50M mutation. So this is another stabilizer with phase two studies that have shown some degree of increase in serum TTR levels, as well as stabilization of the TTR tetramer. And phase three studies are currently ongoing. So hopefully we'll have new information soon about additional stabilizers. Great, thanks so much. So that was at the level of the protein. And Julie, how about if we go back a step to the liver? Tell us about the silencer therapies uh, that we now have available for TTR amyloid. Good morning, Martha, and thank you. Yes, we currently have two silencer therapies approved specifically for individuals living with hereditary amyloidosis, the polyneuropathy phenotype. These two silencers, while have different mechanisms, ultimately have the same goal. And that goal is by preventing translation of that TTR protein. So thus we overall have a decrease in the serum concentration of transthyretin. And as I mentioned, they are mechanistically a little bit different. So the first type of silencer we have is called patizaran. This was first approved back in 2018, specifically in hereditary patients with polyneuropathy. And in the clinical trial, Apollo it demonstrated an overall improvement in these patients' polyneuropathy score, which is four parts in nature, looking at autonomic dysfunction, sensory loss, uh, strength, as well as reflexibility. And it showed improvement over time, suggested that the silencer not only halts the um, progression of amyloidosis, but there's perhaps a potential for regression. We also saw in this clinical trial an improvement in overall quality of life in these patients receiving silencer therapy. Patizaran specifically is an, uh, an infusion medication that is received every three weeks by these patients. Just like we heard with our stabilizer therapies, these are lifelong therapies, specifically the silencer, meaning they're not there to um, completely erase the disease. They're there to sort of slow or delay the progression of disease, but it is going to require lifelong therapy. And in order to receive the infusion, the patients do require pre-medication therapies, specifically with steroids, as well as an antipyretic and antihistamine. So that means every three months, they will be receiving dexamethasone to prevent any sort of infusion reaction. In addition to Petizaran, we have another silencer called inotiercin. I know tyrosine, like patizaran, halts the progression of our TTR protein formation. Like the Apollo B trial, we had neuro-TTR. And neuro-TTR specifically looked at patients with hereditary polyneuropathy. 
And like in the Apollo B trial, we also saw an improvement in their overall neuropathy function as well as quality of life. Similar to patizaran, this too will be a lifelong therapy, but the administration of inotizaran is something patients can do in the comfort of their own home by providing themselves with a sub-Q injection once a week. However, this medication is a little bit different and it does require specific monitoring as we did see some safety signals, particularly with regard to thrombocytopenia as well as glomerulonephritis. So renal function as well as platelet counts do need to be followed. Great, and um, you might just tell the audience what happens to the serum TTR levels on the silencer therapy. Excellent question. So unlike stabilizers where we see an increase in our transthyretin concentration, and if you're looking in your own labs, that would be mimicked as your pre-albumin levels, in individuals with silencers, since we're preventing formation of transthyretin, you'll see an overall decrease in your pre-albumin levels. Great. I think that's a really important clinical point. And then for the audience to know, so again, these silencers right now are only approved for hereditary patients with neuropathy. They can have cardiac involvement, but not just isolated cardiac involvement. And then there are what I call the next generation of both of these drugs um, that are easier to administer, subcutaneous, um, sometimes once, uh, even once a month or every three months, maybe even less than that. So there's a lot going on with cardiac trials now, both with these agents, but also with the next generation. So we're really going to have some exciting data coming in the future of how to use these for our patients with uh, amyloid cardiomyopathy. And Melissa, maybe can you tell us what's going on as far as disrupting the fibrils? Yes. So there are several emerging agents for disruption or degradation and really two phase one studies. So PRX004 is an intravenous monoclonal antibody. This is actually administered via an IV infusion every 28 days, and it clears amyloid deposits by binding to the misfolded TTR. Another form is N1006, which is a recombinant IgG1 human monoclonal antibody. This really is aimed at targeting and the misfolded and aggregated form of TTR. So of course, just phase one studies currently, but lots of new things on the new and exciting things on the horizon for degradation and disruption of those amyloid fibrils. And that's always something that patients ask about. I will comment that there's been a lot of interest in this type of therapy, um, including an AL amyloidosis, and there will be probably some newer trials going on, but it, it, it's not an easy thing anyway. And I've always wondered once if you actively degrade the fibrils, what will be left behind, but we have a lot to learn in this area. Sometimes you, um, some providers might see patients that are on the combination of doxycycline and Tudka, which was um, promoted based on some animal studies as far as being a fibril disruptor. So you might still see patients on that if they're doing really well, sometimes we continue them, but we're not usually initiating patients on that uh, uh, therapy at this time. Um, and then Julie, back to the liver, you're the liver expert. Tell us, and we've heard a lot in the news about CRISPR therapy, particularly for TTR amyloid. Yes, CRISPR-Cas9 intervention is a gene suppression therapy that made headlines this past June in the New England Journal of Medicine, specifically looking at only six patients with hereditary polyneuropathy. This was a phase one clinical trial, and I think um, it's far from prime time, but certainly exciting. And with the use of CRISPR therapy, what we saw we could do is um, induce the cell's natural repair process to overall delete that TTR mutation and suddenly knock down all TTR formation. And so the question is, will this actually work um, and clinically have benefits? So I think there's more to come, but certainly exciting, particularly when we think about our other current therapies that are requiring either daily administration or weekly or every few weeks. The idea of this is it's just a one-time infusion. So certainly more to come. It's just, it is really amazing when we went from almost no treatment for this disease, well, nothing for wild type TTR other than organ transplant um, and liver transplant was our only real therapy for hereditary amyloid to all of these potential therapies. So it's just an explosion in um, a good way. And I wanna highlight for the audience, I mean, sometimes the most important thing we can do for our patients is to give them resources, where to get more education and also how to stay informed about clinical trials. So I've just listed for you 
you. Uh, we actually have a Mayo Clinic AMLA YouTube channel, believe it or not. Um, there are a lot of excellent uh, patient support groups and uh, patient advocacy groups, including uh, the Amyloidosis Foundation, Amyloidosis Research Consortium, and the Amyloidosis Support Group. Also for faculty members, not listed here, but there is a group that it really helps bring education to medical students, so can help you with your faculty if you uh, need to make sure that medical students are learning about amyloid, which of course um, the three of us think that there's need for more education. And then I just highlight all the different things that are on our YouTube channel, which includes a genetic counselor. Uh, and of course, that's not a substitute for genetic counselor uh, in person, but some really important uh, information for our patients on those YouTube uh, uh, videos that are available. And then just to highlight that in amyloid in general, but even especially in cardiac amyloid, we have a big group of uh, um, individuals from all of the various um, sites, Rochester, Arizona, and Florida, who um, you know really are specialists in seeing and treating these patients. So it's really been our pleasure to share this information uh, with you. Thank you so much to Julie and Melissa, and thank you to our audience uh, for joining us.